Look at this list of the best-selling albums ever. Why are they all old as hell? Is our Lord and Savior, Lover Boy, Drizzy Drake, Champagne Pappy, Six God, Aubrey Graham not good enough for the all-time greats? I mean, he said it himself. He said, not sure if you actually know, but I'm Michael, oh. He said, not sure if you know, but I'm actually Michael Jackson. Now, what did he mean by that? Is it popularity? Is it dance moves? Is it bizarre plastic surgery and underage sex allegations? Well, it might actually be that last one. But seriously, when Drake calls himself MJ, he's talking about album sales and billboard charts. When CLB came out, Drake put nine songs in the top 10 at once. He broke MJ's record of seven that had stood all the way since Thriller back in 1980 something. And breaking this record brought back into the conversation all the other Michael Jackson records that Drake has broken. And people were pretty quick to point this out. A question that had been in people's minds for a while now suddenly had a lot more traction. Is Drake really more popular than Michael Jackson? Well, yeah, he has broken a few of his records and yeah, he won't stop talking about it, but that can't be the whole story. And it isn't. Michael Jackson's peak was long before the era of streaming began, which has proved itself to be a turbulent and volatile era of oversaturation for the music industry. It's a stark contrast to the analog world of the last century. So in what ways can Drake's career really be compared to Michael Jackson's? So let's look back at the list of best-selling albums. Michael Jackson is all over it, but Drake isn't on it at all. But he's not the only one you'd be surprised to see missing. You look at the last 20 years of album sales and, well, unless you're Adele or Taylor Swift, albums in general just haven't been selling well at all for the last 20 years. This is a story of how the music industry completely changed sales, to the point where today's musical legends look like nothing compared to the pop stars of yesterday. Let's get into it. Before the 2000s, if you wanted to listen to a specific album or song, you had to drive to the music store, buy a physical copy in CD, vinyl, or cassette tape form, and take it home, and add it to your physical collection of music that took up real physical space. Lars Ulrich, Metallica's drummer, illustrated how different it used to be. He said, 30, 40 years ago, I would get on my bike, ride to the record store, spend time figuring out which record I could buy by listening to a bunch of them, and by the time I got home, that thing was so valuable to me, I would end up spending every minute of my free time for the next week just sitting and listening to that particular record. He said, now Nowadays, music to an extent has become a kind of background noise. I mean, I know that's true for me. I've literally been listening to music the entire time I've been working on this video. But anyway, back then, musicians had truly dedicated fans. You couldn't just pick and choose any artist and listen to their entire discography for free whenever you wanted to. It took dedication to the artist and actual effort to go pick up a record and listen to it. Experimenting with new artists was tough because you'd have to listen at the store before you bought their music. On top of all of this, genres were much less saturated with musicians. Sure, there were still a lot of people making music music, that much hasn't changed. But there weren't really that many who were able to get their music past their local scene and into stores. Music stores were mostly dominated by a handful of musicians from each genre who were able to make it big. If this sounds like a strange time to any of you who were born after 1995, which is a lot of you, including me, it's because that's not at all how it works anymore, and it's all thanks to streaming. Physical music sales peaked in 2000, and they've been falling ever since. And the release of Napster a year later marked the beginning of the end. Even though it wouldn't reach the mainstream for another 10, 15 years, people were realizing the potential value that streaming had, and services like the iTunes Store and Spotify were the nail in the coffin for physical sales. But it kind of makes sense. Why would you want to go out and buy a $20 CD of one album when you could just pay $10 a month to listen to as much music as you want? anytime. Or better yet, you could just listen to it for free on YouTube or on the pirate pay. Streaming is perfect for the listener, but for just about everyone else, it's a mixed bag. Artists have to directly compete with millions of others online, and they only get paid a tiny amount, like a fourth of a cent whenever their music gets played. Of course, they have access to hundreds of millions of potential listeners all in the same place, and they can independently produce their music and release it without a record label. Anyway, before streaming, music data collection was simple. Services like Nielsen SoundScan and the RIAA collected total albums and single sales through various methods, which was easy because a sale equaled a sale. There really wasn't any ambiguity about it. But suddenly they had to figure out how much does a song have to be streamed to count as being sold once? Well, let's strap in because this gets a bit messy. The two organizations who count sales came up with two different numbers. For Billboard to compile the Billboard charts, 10 song downloads from an album is equivalent to one album unit. And and 1250 premium streams or 3750 free streams from the same record is equivalent to one album unit. They combine both of these numbers plus pure sales and use that for their charts. This is actually why a lot of albums are long now. If 10 song downloads from one record equals one sale, an album with 20, 30 tracks, that's going to be sold three times every time it's downloaded. Now, the RIAA does it very differently. For songs, 150 streams of audio or video equal one track sale. For albums, 1500 total streams throughout the album equals one album sale. 
This is why a lot of the time the RIAA numbers are much higher than the billboard numbers. So I think you can imagine the absolute mess of numbers that's resulted from this change in counting methodology. In recent years, sales numbers for albums have gone wild. They just don't make sense anymore. Because basically on paper, at least compared to the past, they're just not selling. Let's look at one example. Certified Loverboy saw 744 million streams in its first week, 74,000 streams per minute. But due to the music industry's counting methods, that only counted for a total of 613,000 sales on the Billboard charts. That's 750 million streams, almost a billion streams in a week, equaling out to around half a million sales. Compared to hit albums in the 90s and 2000s, regularly selling close to 10 million units in their first year, and the best-selling albums of all time like Thriller, Bad, Rumors, Back in Black, all those classic albums have sold well into the realm of 20, 30, even 40 or 50 million sales. It's clear that the industry has hit a point where it would be hard to deny that it's much more saturated with choices of what to listen to, and its method of counting sales has clearly affected numbers. No artist besides Adele has sold 5 million copies in the first year since Usher in 2004. By the way, how does Adele sell so many albums? Like, her numbers are astronomical compared to everybody else. I'm just imagining that she's regular famous, but there's some weird club out in England somewhere that buys trucks full of her records and just dumps them in a warehouse to help her sell more, like a BTS fan army type thing. Anyway, Look, we have so many different methodologies and different ways to interpret the numbers, but the one thing that they all point to is less sales overall. No matter how you look at it these days, albums just don't sell as much as they used to. But what does that really mean for comparing the popularity, success, and fame of Drake and Michael Jackson? Drake was the first artist on Spotify to surpass 50 billion streams. Does this mean Drake is more popular than Michael Jackson? At the same time as he racks up more than 50 billion streams, far more than Michael Jackson, he can hardly sell more than one or two million copies of an album in its first year. And that's far are fewer than Michael Jackson. So look, sales are clearly not a reliable indicator of fame and impact, at least not nowadays. I mean, Ed Sheeran has way more listeners on Spotify than Drake does, and I don't see anyone making a video saying he's better than the king of pop. So I want to look at other factors that capture the scope of Drake and MJ's fame together, and actually try to understand how famous each of them is around the world. Because honestly, at this point, not even someone as popular as Drake can even begin to hope that they might one day have one of the best-selling albums of all time. There is never going to be a new best-selling album of all time. It's just not going to happen again. Thriller will stand as the best-selling album ever, forever. Drake may have billions of streams, but even his most successful records don't even remotely come close to the sales of Thriller. Views has 6 million copies sold. Scorpion has 5 million. Thriller still sells a million copies every single year, despite being 40 years old, and it sold a total of more than 70 million copies worldwide. So how do streams stack up to sales in terms of fame? It's pretty hard to say. But only one side of the Drake versus Michael Jackson rivalry has ever been beloved by billions of people around the world to the point where he was crowned the king of a West African kingdom. Let's talk about Africa. In 1740, a small kingdom was established in the Ivory Coast by migrants from Ghana. In 1959, this small kingdom, known as the Sanwi Kingdom, was merged with the Ivory Coast, and they had a population of around 40,000 people. In 1992, around 30 years later, based on mystic readings and the worldwide frenzy around MJ's fame, Michael Jackson was crowned the king of the Sanwi, and he actually went there to accept the honor. I mean, what does Drake get? He gets memes on TikTok. Oh, Drake the type of caveman to pick up his rock phone and say, call me back later. Drake the type of caveman to keep his torch lit all night. Drake the type of caveman to say grug grug grug. I mean, no one really takes Drake seriously anymore. That's just not the nature of fame in the modern day. We see him as a guy. We see him as a pretty flawed guy. I mean, he commands a lot of respect from some people, but at the same time, he's basically a joke. But at the peak of his fame, Michael Jackson was not even seen as a real person. People were literally worshiping him. He had such a clear and strong vision and so much control over how people saw him. It's hard for someone like me, essentially born into the streaming world, the social media world, to understand the level of fame that Michael Jackson had. He had peers, but only a tiny handful. He was and still is the highest paid entertainer of all time. He was the king of an African tribe and Jesus, the internet went down when he died. I sound like a broken record, but what I'm trying to emphasize is Michael Jackson was a global cultural phenomenon. But Drake, despite breaking records left and right and pretty much being on the top of the music industry, is still competing with dozens of other artists because that's just how it works. Drake competes with Justin Bieber, Ed Sheeran, Doja Cat, Adele, Ariana Grande, other rappers like Kanye, Kendrick. So you look back at all of this and ask the question again, how can Drake really be compared to Michael Jackson. Well, he really can't be. Nobody can ever be MJ again because fame at his level isn't possible anymore. So for Drake to call himself Michael Jackson is kind of goofy. Drake isn't getting crowned the king of any African tribes. He's getting booed off the stage at Camp Flogna because even though he's so famous, even though he's so popular, no one wanted to see him. And I'm not trying to hate on Drake. I've said it before. I'm a huge fan of Drake's music. He's undeniably one of the biggest musicians of today and he has a huge influence on the world of hip hop, R&B, pop, but you can't go around biting MJ like that and expecting people 
people to go along with it. Numbers just don't cut it, especially when the numbers don't even really begin to compare.